Welcome to Mission Majima. Ajahn. Ajahn. So, Ajahn, tell us about the Chula Dukkha Kanda Sutta, the shorter discourse on the mass of suffering, Majjhima Nikaya 14. In this sutta, we meet Mahanama, uh, the Buddha's cousin, uh, the brother of Anuruddha and the brother of Ananda, I believe. And he comes to the Buddha, he's been practicing for a long time, and he clearly sees that greed, anger, and delusion, that they're drawbacks, they're upakilesas, these uh, defilements of the mind, but he still has greed, anger, and delusion invading the mind and remaining. So he asks how to get around this, what is he not seeing correctly? And the Buddha, similar to the greater discourse on the mass of suffering, Majjhima number 13, which we talked about last week, the Buddha gives this Buddhist cost-benefit and alternative analysis, the exact same, actually, in terms of the benefits, the allure of the sight, sound, smells, taste, touch, which are wished for, desirable, agreeable, likable, connected with sensual desire, and provocative of lust. The Buddha talks about all of the different drawbacks of sensuality as well, um, that you have to work to maintain them, you have to work to get them, and they're not even that good and that all of our sensual addictions and cravings and obsessions actually have wider implications. They lead to war on a greater, uh, on a larger scale. The Buddha pointing all that out. And in terms of pointing out the escape or the alternative in this analysis, the Buddha goes back, harkens back, tells this story. It's a, um, an embedded quote. So we have quotes inside of quotes inside of quotes, five or six levels deep. Um, and the Buddha tells this story of meeting the Nigantas. This is one of the first times that we've met the Jains, the Jaina, uh, Niganta Nataputta or Mahavira, uh, where the Buddha has this discussion with these ascetics who think that happiness or pleasure comes from pain, whereas uh, they have this back and forth about their belief and the Buddha kind of suggesting that they don't see things so clearly. Mm-hmm. And I just like to read kind of what I feel is really the um, heart of the sutta where the Buddha says, even though a noble disciple has seen clearly as it actually is with proper wisdom, that sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering and despair, and that the danger in them is still more. As long as they do not attain to the rapture and pleasure that are apart from sensual pleasures, apart from unwholesome states, or to something more peaceful than that, they may still be attracted to sensual pleasures. Mm. And then at the end of the sutta, the Buddha describes this kind of sukha showdown with King Bimbisara. Um, the Nigantas, the Jains, kind of challenge the Buddha to say, yeah. Um, yeah, who has more pleasure, you or King Bimbisara? And the Buddha says that he can sit and meditate and experience exclusively happiness, exclusively mm. pleasure for seven days without moving, without speaking. And can King, B- King Bimbisara do that? No. Nope. Basically, mm. uh, and the same could be said of any billionaire these days. Mm. So that's great. Yeah. How about for yourself, Ajahn? What do you find most interesting or intriguing about this sutta? I think the, um, I mean, first the uh, list of drawbacks of sensuality, like you noted, it's every time you read it in the sutta before this or this one, it's harrowing and um, brilliant and illuminating. But the unique aspects of this sutta that I find quite compelling, um, are first the quote you read, where uh, the Buddha says that even though one might have seen the drawbacks of sensuality until one has achieved a pleasure apart from that sensuality, that it's hard to give up. Um, And just that acknowledgement. um, And then kind of reframing uh, this path as one of pleasure, um, both in terms of refuting the Jain's uh, approach of just pain and asceticism and uh, self-torture, and in making very clear that actually the Buddha's approach to life and pleasure is more effective than, you know, even King Bimbisara, the sort of height of a sensualist or, or one who could achieve that height. And rather than drawing out any kind of particular point of doctrine, I find that this is just so relevant in terms of the pitfalls of a modern practitioner's approach to the path. In a modern context, um, just the act of renunciation being looked at by the modern culture as something so foreign, um, that was also a thing that the Buddha dealt with. And there's a great sutta, Majjhima Nikaya 75, the Magandhya Sutta, where another wanderer calls 
the Buddha a destroyer of growth, kind of this life-denying uh, renunciant um, who's just, you know, why aren't you enjoying this beautiful life given to us? And the Buddha reframing there as here, the fact that actually renunciation is a path to greater and more refined pleasure in the heart. It's not an act of, um, you know, a life. It, it's not a path of pain. And that's such a radical inversion of our usual way of looking at, at things. Um, and also just to see that when people, I find, move into the Buddhist path, often they um, really take up this language of renunciation and giving up things without understanding that there needs to be a warmth of the heart cultivated in the meantime. And, you know, perhaps in the sutta it's referenced as the pleasure and rapture coming from the first and second jhana or above. But even in the absence of that, for a practitioner to acknowledge that if you're giving up this sensuality, like you need to be replacing um, that sense of well-being with the pleasure that comes from other wholesome aspects of the path, giving, community, faith, um, and just that acknowledgement that this is supposed to be a path beautiful in the beginning, beautiful in the middle, beautiful in the end, um, not just of self-torture. Ajahn, uh, what first would you like to point to, or is there anything else you'd like to draw out of the sutta? Yeah, no, I mean, you refer to this phrase in the suttas that the Dhamma is beautiful in the beginning, beautiful in the middle, beautiful in the end. And you can also say in a certain way that the, the Dhamma is a teaching that is, in a certain way, is pleasurable in the beginning, the pleasure mm. of morality, the pleasure, beautiful, or pleasurable in the middle, pleasurable in the end, uh, Nibbana being the highest happiness and Samadhi being the highest form of, of Vedana, of feeling. In terms of firsts, we have our first meeting with Mahanama, the Buddha's cousin, first meeting with Niganta Nataputa, i.e. Mahavira, and a first uh, appearance of several quotes such that greed, anger, and delusion invade the mind and remained, and a quote that sensual pleasures uh, provide little gratification, much suffering and despair, and that the danger in them is still more. And I just so appreciate that, you know, having given pointed to all these drawbacks of sensuality, which you see and intuit, and most people just mm. learn to ignore it through the course of a life because they don't see anything better. Here at the end, we've got this, yeah, this sukha showdown, and mm. it's like the best, you know, the, the best billionaire, the Buddha, can experience way more pleasure than them. Mm. And I think the, the type of sukha he's talking about is not just the sukha of Nibbana, but even the sukha mm. of the happiness and the pleasure of of jhana, of meditative absorption that someone can uh, immerse oneself into for the course of seven days and experience this unalloyed bliss mm. uh, without speaking or moving, which, I mean, what billionaire, millionaire, anybody could do that for even, you know, a couple of hours. Um, so impressive. Yeah. And Ajahn, anything else to highlight in the sutta? You know, I think just one thing quickly to note is the Buddha's use of Socratic method you know, where he's questioning the followers of the Jains. Um, it's such a brilliant technique to use with an interlocutor and um, to sort of draw them to, uh, bring them to the same conclusion, to, to seek truth, but with another. Um, so I really appreciate that approach. Uh, also to note that the Jains approach of quote unquote burning through old karma by watching it manifest and not reacting to it, or sort of even initiating pain. Um, there are echoes of that, even in modern practice circles, of just uh, feeling that it's just enough to let kind of old karma come up and then fade, or um, to not react. But actually, while patient endurance is a beautiful quality in the Buddhist path, there's more to it. There's this cultivation of pleasure as well. Mm -hmm. So just to see a sort of, there are echoes of that philosophy still prevalent in modern circles as well. Great point. So, Ajahn, what's the word of the day? The word of the day is dukkha. So, dukkha, a uh, very important concept, sometimes, almost always translated unsatisfactorily because, well, the word itself uh, really has no English equivalent. It's translated as suffering, it's translated as unsatisfactoriness, it's translated as stress, but it really serves, I mean, it's the full, all conditioned things the Buddha said are dukkha. And that includes the highest form of pleasure is dukkha in the sense that it's not perfect. Uh, it's incomplete. 
Mm. Um, it's going to end even the highest jhana that the Buddha points to in this sutta being, uh, just absolutely, totally pleasurable. It's going to end and then one is going to suffer. So mm. dukkha is everything that's not Nibbana. Mm. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ajahn. And we hope uh, to see everyone next week for Majjhima Nikaya 15. Ajahn. Ajahn. <laughs>